and lovely listeners, and welcome to the official fake sophomore episode <laughs> of Dead and Lovely. Here with your good host, Uncle Ben, and my good man. Who's this man on the other end of this Skype call here? It's me, future Steve. You're Steve from the future? Yeah. Holy oh, man, guys. Shit. Just wait till you get to the Exorcist episode. Oh, look out, man. All bets are off. All religion <laughs> is is crushed. So here's yeah. the deal, guys. Um, you're listening to this as the second episode, our Pumpkinhead episode. But we're actually recording this as, I don't know, what, like our 10th or 11th episode, Steve? Yeah, I believe, yeah, 10th or 11th. The last one that we recorded was The Exorcist, correct? Yes. So that's actually where we are in time right now. Our original second episode, our sophomore Pumpkinhead episode, was recorded many moons ago. And upon reviewing the, the audio that we recorded, I found it to be quite unusable. You see, the way that we record the podcast <laughs> now is a little different than the way we used to. I'm over here in yeah. in Tennessee um, recording onto my computer. Steve is out there on the West Coast being on Hollywood recording yeah. via his line on a Skype call. And basically what we ended up finding through our trial and error experimentation, such as the original Pumpkinhead episode that we did months ago, is that it's better for Steve to record his audio separate and then for me to replace his audio track here. So that way you guys get a good, clean audio signal without any of the blips and burps that the uh, that the Al Gore internet connection provides. So yeah, the original Pumpkinhead episode was doomed. Um, but now, mm-hmm. here we are, reporting from the future. I mean, by now we're already like millionaires off of the podcast, which is pretty sick. <laughs> I think the worst part about those first couple of episodes was that uh, I was recording on a headset microphone. Oh. And I have since improved my recording situation. You got your rig straightened out. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Damn. Damn. So here we are recording our fake. Uh, you know, this is a pretty interesting way to do the sophomore slump kind of thing. This isn't at all like Creed's Human Clay uh, record. <laughs> I hope that this will be more of a God soft- damn. I'm glad we got a Creed <laughs> reference in. I I hope this is more like a sophomore effort, like Van Halen Two was a sophomore effort, where a lot of people yeah. are like, it actually might be better. Right. But this might be the only time that somebody's sophomore record has been done in the future. And you know what? This is interestingly, I would guess we did near dark and that recording didn't work out the original legendary pilot episode of dead and lovely that actually which was everybody i showed it to which might have actually just been me said that it was the best podcast they'd ever listened to in their lives but then we did phenomena which came out uh, okay Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. recording was fine. Yeah. I think it, it was a good episode for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and now, and now we're repeating Pumpkinhead, so we are on. Technically, I guess this would be the fourth episode. Huh. <laughs> we we are repeat sophomores. This is our. It's like we would be uh, like seventeen-year-old sophomores. I have a feeling with all this like time travel and redoing of the past and future, this is the kind of thing that would make J.J. Abrams just openly jizz in his pants. <laughs> so right before we started this podcast, me and Stephen were recounting our uh, our concept emo band that we had in college, which oh, was yeah. which was a little group by the name of Stained Scars, which is Stained a Stained uh, Scars. <laughs> Which was a fake emo band that we were going to start in the MySpace era that we never really got around to doing, but I'm really thinking that we should. And uh, Stephen had actually yeah. even pinned some some lyrics for uh, the song Stained Scars. Right, yeah, uh-huh. Um, um, which I, if I recall... Stained Scars? Yeah. That, that was uh, Stained Scars that you gave me. <sighs> I, I don't remember what happened after that, but eventually we said, "I wish my heart was a gunship." Oh man, no, that was that was one of the, the one of the lines in our our second hit. I wish today oh, right. was tomorrow. <laughs> I wish today was tomorrow. I wish my heart was a gunship. Oh man! So in, Jesus. In addition to that project, which we really need to get to over the um, over the weekend, I was spending some time with my good buddy. 
uh, Travis Toy, who is a devastating steel guitar player and uh, multi-instrumentalist that plays for uh, Rascal Flats. We were playing a show together uh-huh. with my man Andy Wood in Knoxville. And uh, he was discussing this idea that he had on the spot there about a new genre of heavy metal that he wants to create. And the biggest stipulation here is that the minimum age requirement is you have to be at least, like, bare minimum, like, 81 years old to be a part of this genre. (laughs) Uh, It's going to be something that he calls near-death metal. (laughs) (laughs) And we were kind of brainstorming about it and stuff and how it's like they're in the genre. There's always, like, there's always new bands showing up because, like, all the old ones keep dying and stuff. Right. (laughs) And how, like, maybe <laughs> some of the, some of the band like, there's a lot of EPs that get put out because, like, a- again, they keep perishing before they can release a full length. Right. <laughs> but, but there's even some of them that, like, you'll go and it turns out that the band, like, you know, they got a name, they got a logo, they got their artwork for the album, you know, figured out and all that stuff. But before they could actually record the record, they had all died. So sometimes you'll buy a near-death metal <laughs> CD and you open it up and the case is just empty. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. I I love this idea, and I I can imagine people being like, "Oh yeah, I followed them back when he was only 83." <laughs> Man, we Dude's were 112 now. We were bouncing all these ideas around too about how like. Oh my God! Like maybe maybe there's a guy who's who's like really follows the genre that's super into it. Like he gets into it late in life when he's like 75, and he's like, I hope I can make it to 81 to start my own near death metal band. And like <laughs> <laughs> he ends up making it to like you know age 81, and like on his birthday he like goes to audition for uh, like Tracheotomy, like his favorite near death metal band. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like in the waiting room waiting for his turn to like go and play drums or something and he like fucking dies oh, in no. the waiting room. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh no. Dude, it gets better. Like I was talking with um I was talking with Corey, uh, who owns the shop that I teach at. We were joking around about this mm-hmm. stuff too. And uh we were talking about how great it'd be if like on the recordings if you know like halfway through a song, like you hear the guitar just kind of like quit playing and it's just like raging screaming <laughs> feedback because like the guitar player like died during the recording <laughs> oh man like really promising 80 year olds that died would be considered part of the forever 80 club <laughs> like, like the oh, historic man. 27 he could have been the perfect near death metal guitarist but oh, he man. died and it's like, you know, death metal can claim to be, like, the most brutal kind of metal because all the lyrics are about, like, killing people and stuff. But in near death metal, like, you actually listen to people die on the recordings. Right. <laughs> it's like... And they would, they would be singing about, like, the real brutal shit, like shitting your pants on accident and, like, <laughs> forgetting, forgetting your children's names. <laughs> stuff like how your dick don't work and things like this. Yeah, <laughs> that's the real dark shit. I want to hear a drummer just like fall, you know, just fall face forward into that drum set. You just hear cymbals fall over and stuff. But <laughs> it, it kind of like it just like really inspires the rest of the band to like rage even harder. So the rest of the yeah. song just gets even faster and more more brutal because they've just seen their drummer <laughs> actually die on record. Like, what would be more brutal than that? I cannot. I- I, I can't think of a single thing. <laughs> Near death metal. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm <laughs> loving it. Uh, Travis is also suggesting too that whenever you get the whenever you get the records or EPs or whatever, like most of the <laughs> most of the liner notes are just eulogies of the band members. <laughs> oh no! Oh shit! <laughs> oh man! R.I.P. It's so brutal though, like. <laughs> That's all you're reading is about how everyone in this band you just discovered and maybe love is now dead. <laughs> it's killing me. Like, the, awesome. more, the more I think about it, I'm like a Christopher Guest style, you know, mockumentary yeah. like has to be made about this. It'd be the yeah, fucking funniest be awesome. thing. And we were kind of thinking like already like the biggest, maybe that would even be the biggest band in near death metal is Eulogy. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so trade trademark 
trademark uh, dead lovely podcast on the near death metal uh, mockumentary <laughs> and the band name eulogy because it's gotta happen <laughs> oh man well have you watched anything good lately there steve have i watched anything good lately yeah i've watched uh, a good bit of good lately mm. um the Mystery Science Theater 3000 uh, new season. Okay, is it good? Because uh, I was real skeptical. I haven't watched it yet. It, I really love it. Good. It is so, it's so faithful to the original. It's so much like the original. But, I mean, you know, it's uh, updated with new people. I love uh, Patton Oswalt, Felicia Day, John Oh, he's Ray. on there. Uh, yeah, it's so many great people involved with it. Hampton Yunt, uh, Baron Vaughn, like... It, it's it's a really really good version of a new mystery science theater 3000 and they they really haven't changed the format they haven't they haven't changed the production value even. good it, it's really good awesome i can't wait to watch that then yeah i highly recommend it the um uh cry cry wilderness i believe is the name of the episode mm-hmm uh, had one of my my favorite things I've ever heard before, Uh-oh. and when you watch the episode, you'll get it. But it was Mary Sasquatch. Oh wait, Mary Bigfoot. Uh, <laughs> it really funny. You're really gonna like this. I'm telling you. I can't wait to watch it, man. I've been um, I've been watching Crystal Lake Memories, which is a oh, yeah. documentary about the Friday Thirteenth flicks. Have you seen it? Uh huh. Yeah, I have not seen that yet. It is six hours and forty minutes long. Really? Yeah, because I mean, it goes through every. Is it one of is them. it worth it? Like the the um, the Nightmare on Elm Street documentary, which is like four and a half. You'd be, I think you'd be That's speaking definitely about worth it. Never sleep again. Um, yeah, this is made, definitely worth it, and doesn't seem too long. No, it doesn't. This is made by the same people. Is it? Yep. Okay, so it flows well i imagine yeah and it's kind of the kind of a similar format and stuff the only thing the only thing that it lacks that i thought was really neat and just kind of a fun bonus about never sleep again is do you remember like when they'd go from like part one to part two to part three there'd be like a little like claymation animation Uh uh-huh it does it doesn't have that um and i do miss that because i thought that was just a cool signature of that yeah that was that that was really cool um but but it's still really really fantastic it's really fun to learn about all the stories and stuff that are going on with those movies. So I'm about three quarters of the way through that. And we just started watching um, Preacher on Hulu. Oh, yeah. Holy fucking Um, shit. I have not watched that. Is it great? Oh, fuck yeah. It's awesome. Now, I I will say I've never read the comics. I remember whenever the comics... I have not either. Yeah. like I remember as a kid in the late 80s, early 90s, I always remember reading in Wizard Magazine and shit about like how how great Preacher was, like how it was just a bomb, but... I think that was definitely something that was way over the line too sacrilegious to be in my house. So I never had, right. I never, never had them. So I never read them. But the series has made me really interesting or interested to read the books. Um, I've been really fucking impressed. We're like four or five episodes in. You will love it. I can't wait to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, I, I thought about watching it today, actually. Um... Uh, instead, I watched Mystery Science Theater 3000, so I, I'll definitely check it out. Yeah, yeah, you'll you'll like it. I'm watching it on on Hulu right now. They got the first season up. It's really really good. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Well, so, um, so we're 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 re-recording the Pumpkinhead episode. That we are. And I'm gonna go ahead and tell you, it's gonna be new. It's gonna be improved. It's gonna be the best thing you've heard all week. It's gonna be the best episode of us talking about pumpkin head that you've ever heard yeah for sure 100 <laughs> <100%. laughs> percent. but you know maybe that's the good thing maybe it's like maybe if creed could go back and listen to human clay and like hear their sophomore maybe. slump and retry it like how much different would it be God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man if, if you keep bringing up creed for the rest of the existence <laughs> of this podcast, every single time I'm gonna laugh. It'll always it's be just fine. It's gonna happen. Well, <laughs> Pumpkinhead was uh, was released in 1988, and I did not see it as a Kinder child. Actually, the first time that I saw this movie was when we reviewed it the very first time several months ago. So I, right. I, I watched it once a couple months ago, and we did our, our review, which you shan't hear. 
And then I just watched it again several months later. I watched it last night again. And um, it's a pretty enjoyable flick. It's a pretty enjoyable movie. It's um, I think there's several reasons that make it completely worth watching, namely the, the visual effects. Right. Which I think especially like after watching it a second time, the visual effects are ridiculously good. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's so great. Like, the, the way that Pumpkinhead looks and the way that Stan Winston decides to continually show the costume yeah. to show, like, the person in the costume. Yeah. And there, there aren't seams. I, I'm not uh-uh. looking at it and thinking, like, this is, like, fake yeah it looks so well done yeah throughout the movie i yeah it's it is the the crown jewel of this movie for sure i completely agree it's like i really have a hard time thinking of i have a hard time thinking of any other movie where i see a full body still shot of a man in a rubber suit that looks as convincing as this like it it's it's legit up there with some people might crucify me for saying this, but it's totally up there with stuff like the, you know, the Queen Alien and Aliens and stuff mm-hmm. like this, which makes sense because well, Stan Winston and his team works yeah. on those flicks. <laughs> Stan Winston, yeah, if you guys don't know, is a is a special effects titan who worked on like a couple of couple of talkies you might have heard of, like the the Terminator flicks, um, mm-hmm. so Jurassic Park, a Jurassic Park, which I have seen many times, um, the Aliens flicks. I think he did JP one two th- one two and three, didn't he? Yeah, he also did the first two Predator films. Oh shit! Um, did he really? And Iron Man. What? Yeah, this guy he 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 gets won around four Academy Awards for effects. So wow, he, he knows what he's doing. And, and this and is his first time directing. He wrote and directed yeah. the movie, correct? Uh, and this this is early in his career but he he had already won a a couple of awards at this point and had worked on you know some real big movies so for him to decide to do a low budget horror picture where he gets he gets a good bit of control and he gets to work mainly on showing off how great he is at effects yeah like it's a real smart move definitely Uh, so and and the movie is is very, very, very obviously centered around the visuals. The visuals of the movie are really fantastic. The storyline itself is very simple and very linear. And it is, but I I think that uh, there's a lot to say for this. What he does with this, I, this this is in some ways a slasher film. Yeah. Um. It it fits into a mold kind of like. Nightmare on Elm Street or Friday the 13th. But what we get here is the the teenagers that are being slaughtered, only one of them did anything kind of wrong. Yeah, that's a really and interesting thing that I found, man. Like the yeah. typical 80s slasher or monster movie, uh-huh. all these teenagers that get killed, it's because they're like smoking pot or they're having sex right. or they're stealing something or they're a bully or whatever it's like it's always people who you can kind of like you know you can kind of almost get behind the monster for like killing these people because right they're shown to be immoral in some way or whatever Um, right but actually in this movie it's like like you just said it's really just a bunch of innocent people getting slaughtered which actually has a a more profound effect on you as a watcher because you're like why don't kill that person they didn't do anything wrong where yeah, this has a different morality from other slasher films where other slasher films are the morality is about not doing drugs not you know it, like it, it's stupid morality sure. that's just sort of uh shaky yeah the morality here is don't seek vengeance exactly yeah like the one that's yeah. that's the interesting thing about this is like in most of these movies it's the teenagers that are getting slaughtered that are the ones learning about morality but in this it's actually the grown-up learning morality yeah um which is a really interesting twist on 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 a lot of that stuff which i think that's a point about this movie that gets kind of overlooked 
a lot is that oh, yeah. it's really sure. about how you know vengeance will consume you in the end it end up hurting uh, getting a lot of collateral damage you know um so this starts the the opening of this is um like an hour uh, and a half of credits with fire behind it right credits with fire and, and the that great 80s horror synth sort of behind it oh yeah which is uh i wanted to point this out this is by uh richard stone uh i have some problems with the music in this but richard stone's music overall uh he did he composed music and songs for tiny tunes animaniacs pinky and the brain and freakazoid what dude all really great things um, so sidebar freakazoid is one of those yes one of those things that to me was completely hugely responsible for shaping my sense of humor as a young person mm -hmm. and other than you like i don't know anybody that watched that show um, You're right i love it, it was it was a it was one of those that came on it came on a little after the time where animaniacs was yeah. still popular and so i guess yeah some people had sort of moved on from the wb uh animation a little bit and yeah it gosh such a great show that plus like uh monty python flicks plus like adventures of pete mm -hmm. and pete are all things that had pete and pete oh awesome. dude had a huge impact on my sense of humor as a as a kid yeah as well as like so, airplane uh, oh go ahead i said as well as like airplane airplane was like a huge airplane, one to me. yes God. and naked gun oh dude all of those all of those <laughs> shaped my sense yeah, of humor i i like looking back on it uh you know those movies a lot of the the humor is really simplistic uh but it, it really did shape so much of i guess the non sequitur humor that i, I do like right. like a lot of what's in naked gun and airplane is just like what like why yeah. <laughs> that's weird that's an odd thing uh I, I really do like that in in comedy the just strange uh pieces and, and strange elements that seem to be like why is this in here yeah <laughs> that's cool about the music um, though i didn't know that about the guy that did the soundtrack yeah, so anyway, I, I I think there are some problems with the music. Sometimes it's a little too dead on, especially yeah. in scenes with um, Ed and his son. But yeah, uh, you, we get the opening, and then <laughs> there's some screaming. Um, it's 1957. Running, yeah, yeah, 1957. Uh, a family in a in a little house uh the the setup here the the cool warm setup that we get uh is that it, whenever we see people indoors throughout this movie there's this nice like orange lighting yeah very warm. and yeah and then whenever we're outside it's very blue um and that that runs throughout the movie and it, it is nice i mean it it, it <laughs> It plays really well later in a scene when we do see Pumpkinhead in, like, that orange light. Oh, like, definitely so, man. And it's, yeah. it's a cool, very stylized cue, especially for something at this at this time period. Um, yeah. I really like it a lot. And basically, there in the opening, yeah, like you said, we got this little homestead cottage, and there's a, a, a family hunkering into the house, and there's the, the paw of the household battening down the hatches and stuff, telling everybody to stay inside and go to bed. And you hear a guy outside screaming, and he's banging on the door, asking to be let in. And Pa won't let him in, and he's being chased by some kind of monster or something like this. Yeah, he says that um, he didn't hurt that girl yeah. or whatever. So there's there's a backstory here that apparently, you know, he he was accused of and maybe even found guilty of uh, harming a girl. Yeah. And, and so there's this creature after him, and, and, and yeah, and Paul won't help him out. Yep. The, we find out as we go, and, and the story reveals this slowly, but we find out that if you get in the way of Pumpkinhead, he, you were on the list. You're like, on that you shit get list. put on his shit list. Yeah. Um, so Eddie, they, they lock the doors and keep him out. And Eddie looks outside his window, young Edward. 
and uh, mm-hmm. he sees the guy getting like all tossed and thrown about by the old pumpkin head monster. And, and, and we see like this is great. This is this is like first off Stan Winston saying like I want to show off my my ability. Yeah, but also a, a real great thing to do in this era of horror movie uh, filmmaking to just go ahead and show the creature. Yeah. Like full on. Yeah. And full frontal creature. Yeah. Full frontal creature. And uh, Pumpkinhead kind of looks like a xenomorph. Yeah. Very alien. I would say. Which apparently the, so, the designers and so forth of the, of the pumpkin head creature, which that, that was kind of a big surprise to me watching this for the first time is right. with a name like Pumpkinhead, I expected him to be a pumpkin-headed creature, kind of like the kid from Trick or Treat or something like that. Um, I, I expected something kind of Tim Burton-y, maybe. Yeah, exactly. But apparently yeah. the the designers of the creature and stuff kind of took inspiration from like the funny ways that like gourds and things will grow to capture the, the head shape of the pumpkin head, which is kind oh. of an elongated, elongated xenomorph-looking thing, but apparently it was based on... Yeah, gourds and stuff like that, which I, I found kind of huh. interesting. So, That's really cool. Yeah, young Eddie sees all this stuff going on outside, this guy getting mauled, and then it seeks into present day where you see that he grew up to become Lance Hendrickson. <laughs> where he grew up to become Bishop. Yeah, and, and he has a flamethrower even. He's got a flamethrower. Uh, absolutely calling back to aliens like that's that's what that direct is right? callback. There's, there's no other reason direct callback and yeah. uh they uh it, sh- it shows him and he's burning up some weeds and stuff like this outside of his old out of his old homestead and it sounds like like the damn princess bride soundtrack is playing in the background um yeah it's even got like a little <laughs> like nylon string guitar theme that's like boom 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 that uh-huh. sounds just like fucking princess bride um just a quick note on Lance Henriksen. The year before this, he was in Near Dark, mm-hmm. our uh, Phantom first episode. Yes. With Bill Paxton. Now, Bill Paxton and Lance Henriksen hold a unique distinction of being the only two people killed by a Terminator, a Xenomorph, and a Predator. Fuck. Really? That's like the Holy Trinity. Yes. That they rules. were both. They were both in the original Terminator. Yeah. In fact, the original Terminator was written with Lance Henriksen in mind to play Terminator. No doubt. Uh, Actually, you know what? I both, could totally see that. Yeah, absolutely. Huh? Uh, they both died in Aliens, and then um, Lance Henriksen died in Alien vs. Predator, and Bill Paxton died in Predator Two. So that rocks. Uh, I had no idea. It's a cool, cool bit of uh, info there. P.S. So P.S. Lance Henriksen is inspired by a poem. Poem. I, <laughs> I forgot to mention that when we were going through the credits. It says it's inspired by a poem by Ed Justin. Yeah. Uh, I looked it up. It's it's pretty much the thing that the kids say. Um, the the dirty kids. Yeah. At the the shop early on. Yeah. We're like he's so, gonna get you and stuff like this. Yeah. Huh. That's so, cool. And that's what inspired the we'll, movie. Yeah, we'll get to that. There, there's certainly some things in there I want to talk about later when we get to Pumpkinhead, but uh, well, it's we, an interesting little poem. We see Lance Henriksen, uh, who is Ed, and his son, Billy, and you just kind of get the impression that they lead a, a quaint little country life out on the mm-hmm. prairie with the dog Gypsy, which, P.S., is also in real life the dog Mushroom, which you've seen in Gremlins. <gasps> Oh my god. That's the Gremlins dog. I didn't recognize that. Wow. Yeah. And so they're just kind of doing awesome. they're kind of doing homestead stuff and they go inside and uh they're having having a meal or whatever and Billy brings Ed his paw a necklace that he's made that has the image of the the burning man or something on it. <laughs> right. He's like, it's, "Oh, we're yeah, it does look like the burning man." Uh, and he's like, "Pa, just hold on to this. In about twenty years, people are gonna think you're super cool. Yeah, you're gonna be sick as fuck." And so then yeah. we cut to some uh, some kids and a Corvette and some kind of an SUV, and they're rolling down the road, being uh, yeah badass youngsters trying to loosen their load. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
And, yeah, it, it, this is a pretty good uh, comedic moment. It, we see the kids in the SUV and they're talking, and one says something about Joel, and Steve, who is Joel's brother, says, ah, he's all right, or something like that. And then we cut to Joel, and he says to his girlfriend, hand me another beer, babe, as he's driving. Um, and she cool reaches bit. back to get a beer, and there's a gun back there. Yeah, so we like, learned Joel's not a great guy. Not, not not exactly a great person. And, yeah, this is kind of where we get our intro to our, our cast of, of uh, monster fodder for the movie, which, I mean, really very, very plain characters, very thin characters that don't necessarily yeah. have a lot of distinction. Um, you could easily get most of them confused. Kind of like all that you really need to know is that Joel is the asshole driving the Corvette. Um, yeah. His girlfriend, Kim, who seems like maybe kind of a bitch, but not really. Yeah, she just seems like maybe she's being abused. Kind of like that. More more like yeah. that. There's Steve, which is Joel's brother, who seems just kind of like a normal dude. And uh, looks like Adam Devine. Oh, sort of. dude. <laughs> About the the only other kind of like distinct characters in here, like there's there's Maggie, who's kind of the church girl, who's basically That's useless Steve's, the whole uh, movie. Steve's girlfriend. I see. I didn't even know that. That Steve's girlfriend. Yeah. Did, yeah. Didn't even catch uh, that. And then Chris, who is the blandest character. He's kind of I the think. quiet guy, is what I got. Yeah. And there's Tracy, and who's like the photographer Tracy. girl. Yeah. But again, it's they're really they're very much the same person only joel's like a little worse than some of them and maggie's a yes mag and maggie's a little more worthless than the rest of them oh poor maggie and so <laughs> the kids are on the way to a cabin weekend and they stop at the old country store there because lance hendrickson owns it's actually the only freestanding cracker barrel gift store that's not attached to a restaurant <laughs> in the country. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. They walk in and they're DVDs of Hee Haw. Yeah, and like the 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 battery powered raccoon tails and a sack that scurry uh -huh. about and um, oversized and chocolate chairs. bars and things like this. Yeah, there's rocking chairs, <laughs> <laughs> old timey sodas, stuff like that. That's apparently how he makes his living is running this old time country store, and. Basically, they pull over to I guess to get to some supplies and stuff like this. But Joel and Steve, I don't I don't get this. So they're on their way to like this cabin weekend and all this stuff, but these fucking guys just cannot goddamn wait to ride their fucking dirt bikes. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think what happens is because when they first get out, Joel uh, mentions that Billy has Coke bottle glasses. Yeah. And everybody's like, ah, oh, you're an asshole. Um, and so Joel, I guess, wants to show his value. So he's suddenly like, well, if I ride my dirt bike, everybody will see how cool I am. Um, and so, yeah, they, they get on their dirt bikes, you know, to They're just romping. ride around. Uh, now, I, I want to talk about the location here because this, this is shot in Southern California, but there's no way that this was intended to be Southern California. It, it's right? a mysterious location because it seems like Appalachian or something. And even yeah. Ed, Lance Henderson, has like a kind of Appalachian sort of accent and stuff. And yeah. but, but I don't know what geogra geographic locale there is where like there's these you know, Dust Bowl, Arizona looking places like where the little store is. <laughs> but then the cabin is like deep in the forest. And then like yeah. later on the hags the hags place is like in a fucking swamp. Like it's in Louisiana. In a swamp. Right. I have so no idea where this is. But it seems like also that everything is within like walking distance of each other too. Like I don't know. Yes, because they uh, several times like while running they end up at these different places. So yeah, it, it, there's not a lot of distance between the different locations no it's a mysterious landscape that they're in <laughs> something for everybody <laughs> and so while they're while they're over there riding their dirt bikes and stuff this this family from like the dust bowl era from another time another place mm -hmm. in time rolls up to the old country store and yep. they're just kind of the typical face country bumpkins with dirty faces and potato sack clothes and Bobby yeah, Joe and Peggy Jim Sue. gets out. Yeah, Hillbilly Jim is there. He does a suplex. He does. He suplexes, etc. Mayim Bialik, aka TV's Blossom, 
is one of the Dust Bowl children. You're fucking kidding. No way. Not even kidding you. If uh, uh, sh- She doesn't really say much of anything, I don't think. Whoa. But Maya and Bialik is there. That's awesome. And we meet uh, one of, I-, I think, the most important characters in the movie, Bunt. Bunt, he's who, called. Yeah, he is one of uh, the Dust Bowl kids. He looks like Evan Peters, who played Quicksilver in the X-Men movies. Yeah, very much. Um, and he, I would say, because this movie is is like a folk tale. Yeah. Like, if this weren't presented as a horror movie, but presented as a Mark Twain type of folk tale, or, you know, more, I guess more of a, uh, more of a, Faulkner, like a, more of a Southern Gothic type of folk tale, um, he would be Bunt would be our narrator. He'd be the one telling us the story because he it's seems to be the one who knows the most about what's going on. Yeah, who is involved the most in the major like points of the film. You're right, and, and uh, is probably the most charismatic of the characters. Also. Very true. Bunt, he's called. And uh, the Dust Bowl kids start teasing one of the other kids because he he stole this ball or whatever. And that's when they start giving him the pumpkin head poem, um, which, like you said, is what this was all based on, apparently. And so Ed has to leave the store to go and get some some feed for Hillbilly Jim. And so he (laughs) he leaves and tells Billy to kind of watch the shop or whatever. So all these teens are just like... He tells Billy, who... Is a tiny child <laughs> with just a budding mullet. Like his oh, mullet isn't in. enough to intimidate anyone. No, so. but it's kind of, dude. It's it's totally on its way in. Right. And so he's like, yeah, watch the store while I'm gone here. I'll be right back. And the teens are just out there raging on their bikes. And Gypsy, the the dog, runs out at the bikes, and Billy like follows. And uh, so he kind of gets in the path of uh, Joel's dirt bike there, and he gets. Sideswiped. Yes. And yeah, totally demolished by a dirt bike, and he he's out. I mean, we see him move a little bit, but he's pretty much out. Now, here's the thing, Steve. I've heard a lot of people complain that they were like, I don't really understand what could have happened to Billy that made him die, considering he just got kind of knocked over by a dirt bike, yeah. right? What a lot of people don't understand is that mm-hmm. Billy and this is right. sub, this is subtext I'm reading into. Uh-huh. Billy actually had a very rare dirt bike allergy. Yeah. Oh yeah, and the, his father was worried about that, you could tell. And yeah. he left him with the story. He was like, I this was I I read this. It's a cut scene yeah. where he said, "Now, now Billy, you know to not get around dirt bikes." You're, and Billy said, "I know now, Paul, because of my allergies." He said, causing my allergies and he said and billy i'm an android (laughs) also i might be morgan freeman (laughs) and because he's a self-employed uh low-income shop owner there's no way in fucking hell he can afford an epi pen for him so they're just basically hoping that he would never get around uh a dirt bike (laughs) yeah i mean and what were the chances really really at at where they live you saw the kind of locals that live out there killed his mama i mean later we see his mother's grave but if you move the flowers it would say dirt bike death killed by dirt bike (laughs) which i think is my thrash metal band that i'm gonna start so by dirt bike (laughs) Like a, just a hardcore fucking West Coast thrash metal. Band. Oh, Bay Area as fuck, dude. <laughs> yeah, saying hella a lot. And so after after Joel sideswipes him, he gets on the run. He's like, I've got to fucking get the hell out of here. They're gonna bust me if I get caught because he's been drinking and he has like priors yeah. and stuff. Yeah. So uh, he runs off, and the other people run after him. Steve stays um, to watch over the Steve. boy. Yeah, Steve's just an all right kind of guy. Again, showing you that, like, these are not all shithead punk teenagers that deserve to die. Like, yeah. Steve's like, oh, shit. And then all the other all the other teenagers are like, we'll, we'll race to the cabin to get to the phone to make a call to call for help. So they're trying. They're fucking trying. Yeah. And uh, Ed comes back 
and uh, he is not stoked about what he finds. Yeah, he has. He doesn't have any questions. He doesn't want to know what happened. He sees that his boy is is nigh unto death, and that all of those kids, except for this one, Steve, ha- are gone. Right. And, and so he his assumption is that they hit and run. They, they didn't. They thought of his kid as trash. They didn't even think he was worthwhile to stay around. Yep. Uh, and and he looks at Steve, and Steve says this later. He looks at him like he wants to kill him. He gives him a good, just, you know, I I, I want you to die. Look, he's good at that. Um, yeah, great great job by Lance Hendrickson. Um, and then he he takes his his kid home to the hallmark channel music that plays there oh it's hallmark as fuck dude yeah (laughs) it's got that like sleepy rpg town music (laughs) like the town that's like on the outskirts of like the mega city where everything's kind of Uh it's like oh nothing much happens around here but then that (laughs) that's like where your main character uncovers like some kind of ancient amulet and summons uh, a monster that destroys the town and then he gets exiled from it it's that music. Right. Yeah. Um, pretty much like it, what it honestly reminds me of a lot. Did you ever play Wild Arms for PlayStation? No, I did not. It was one of the first like RPGs for PlayStation. It came out pre-Final Fantasy VII, if I recall. And uh-huh. uh, it's pretty it's pretty boring, but it's got – it's one of those ones that's kind of got like a big cult following to it. But it has a lot of like sleepy old west kind of uh, town music like that. That's totally what it reminds me of. And so um, then basically um, <laughs> the other kids arrive at the cabin and this is where they find that Joel has like cut the phone line. He's like, we're not fucking helping this kid. Right. Yeah. Joel, Joel is, he's, he's refusing, uh, he's doing the thing that people do when they know that they could go to jail, which is, you know, they want to get out of it. Uh, you can't blame anybody. I mean, it's obviously if you committed a horrendous crime like accidentally killing a child uh you'd probably not want to go to jail for it uh but he's uh, he's a dirt bag like the stuff he's doing he he cuts the cord uh the phone cord he uh he fights he chris throws tracy yeah he does like he, he tosses her around like he a like dang old rag doll her across the room yeah so uh, hard to hard to really feel for joel but everybody else is really trying yeah it seems that way and he he fights like he he throws like kim and chris into a closet and like maggie is already being worthless and just like oh, what am i gonna do oh. like yeah. she's just being fucking well worthless. yeah because she feels like she could have stopped the kid from from getting hit and also we find that i mean there's there's minimal storytelling about each of these individuals but yeah. We find that Maggie is very religious, uh, so she maybe is feeling a bit of religious guilt. Yeah. Um, but yeah, she's she's out of it. She's worthless. Um, and Ed takes his dead son uh, after you know having uh, determined that he's he's fully dead. He takes his dead son to go see Hillbilly Jim. Yeah. Deliver that feed uh, to him. Yeah, take take him the feed, and then to ask him uh, about a woman uh, he's heard about who could uh, who could help him. Yeah, somebody up in them hills he's heard about. Right, and Hillbilly Jim uh, says, you know, uh, I I don't know anything about that. It's obvious he does, but uh, he doesn't want to get involved. He don't want no and part so, of that shit. Yeah, and so Ed starts to leave, and Bunt. Uh, catches him, stops him on the road, and tells him he knows who he's looking for, and he'll, he'll you know point him the way. Yeah, and it's interesting too because like he says he knows the way, and then like uh, Ed gives him ten bucks, and he's yeah. like, "I'll show you where it's at." So he kind of like accepts the the sin of greed to lead him on his path of yeah. vengeance. That's that's uh, that's what I'm saying. I mean, in a folklore story, I, he he has a sort of uh, a sort of Huck Finn quality to him. Yeah, this you're bunt. right. He's he's our hero. Like he's he's the one who's uh, 
He's getting the advantage. Uh, he's he's he knows turning this into a, a prophet. He's the American hero. Yeah. And so then, like, Ed goes out to find this cabin, which is... It's actually situated in the middle of a King Diamond record cover. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it looks um, awesome. It's like this mossy, overgrown, yeah. swampy, just like perfect witch house. It looks really badass. And uh, I... I talked about this the first time we recorded and i i I feel like i should again the the thing that i i love about swamps especially for horror settings is that swamps are uh they're a good representation of uh, a state in between states Mm. uh like a life like between life and death because a swamp is both land and water right um and and it it reminds us of death it, it, swamps are full of decomposition like decomposing plant matter and, and bodies at the bottom are what kind of keep the swamp um stable at right. the bottom right um cool. and so whenever we see a swamp like this and, and there's a witch there and and she um is able to use death like she does to to create this sort of living creature um it, it's uh, I, I, this is like the perfect setting for that yeah no you're right man totally it's got kind of a lot of a lot of depth to the setting yeah well, he goes in the cabin there and we meet haggis who is the old crone and ha- <laughs> haggis is in severe severe need of lotion perhaps exfoliation <laughs> um certainly conditioner Girl, stay out of the sun she looks like she looked dry she looks like uh uh mary's neighbor and there's something about mary she kind of looks like if you took like the back of madonna's arm skin and turned it into a human yes. right <laughs> yeah and you gave it a, a little wispy beard because she has like these little wispy facial hairs sticking out which is like a really good uh makeup detail that they did dude she looks awesome like haggis looks fucking yeah. awesome she almost looks like a creature out of like legend or labyrinth or something like that where yeah this is where the movie gets weird too because you start well i guess the intro is pretty weird too but you see all this <laughs> like all these very believable real world locales and then this really just fantasy kind of shit that lives right next to it and nobody really seems to question it too much yeah yeah, they, uh, I mean, you know, Hillbilly Jim just doesn't want to talk about it, but um, but the kids know where it is. You know, a Bunt knows where it is. So, yeah, it is It is an interesting world. And this does seem to set it in an Appalachian, like, uh, setting, yeah. because that that is sort of um, a part of the Appalachian culture, that idea that, you know, the, the, the witch is, you know, just... The, the lady next door who knows a few ways to use roots and things to make things turn out good for you. So, like, yeah, this it seems to, like... Further establish tell where us, it's at. Yeah, but again, I don't know where there are mountains and a swamp next to each other. Right. And so, he's like, I need help, you know, bringing my son back. And she says that raising the dead ain't her power. And so, then he, uh... I thought this was kind of funny... He, he also tries to answer her problems with money, um, and he, yeah. he deposits, like, a handful of, uh, it looks like silver dollars into... Uh, and some in, jewelry. Into, like, a cup. And I was thinking, yeah. like, how did he know that that was the place to put the money? Like, what if she was like, God damn it, like, I was using that. <laughs> you know? I had soup in there. Yeah. I was feeding my tarantulas. Yeah. There were two tarantulas near the cup. There were. They were scurrying about. And he's just like, I'll put money in, in here. Like, I'd be kind of mad about that. <laughs> I'll put money in here. <laughs> and apparently, too, I read in some trivia that those are old silver dollars that Lance Hendrickson himself, like, scoured huh. through antique stores and stuff to find specifically for that. Wow. Which is odd attention to, to detail. And he explains. Yeah, he's he's really good in this. I like uh, that's. Um, it's not surprising to me. I mean, after you know, uh, seeing him in, in Aliens, Near Dark, yeah. this, etc. Like, he's really good. It's not surprising he would go out of his way to go grab some silver dollars. That's that's a cool detail. Though. And, and let's not forget his role in Piranha Two: The Spawning. Yeah, <laughs> which was James Cameron's first movie. 
Yeah. It's crazy. He did that and then Terminator. Listen, you got to start somewhere. <laughs> and might piranha. as well be Piranha, too. Uh, Lance, though, really, like, I, I do feel like he's one of the better, one of the best, like, character actors of the 80s and 90s. He's fucking great. Mm -hmm. Super, yeah. super identical, plays great characters. So he explains to, to Haggis that he wants vengeance and stuff, and she's like, you know, you'll pay the ultimate price or whatever, but you can go out to Razorback Holler. Razorback Holler is where folks buried people they were ashamed of. I think that's a pretty fucking right. metal thing to say. Yes. Yeah. It's so metal. And the the fact is, like, when he gets there, that like, the place is it's just like dead oh like, dude everything is like gnarled or dying and yeah it's super metal now where is like the her whereas haggis's house was on a king diamond album cover the 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 swamp there razorback holler is actually from a king diamond music video yes it's bad as shit like there's all this smoke it's everything's so like cool. blue and black yes it's so great and, and the the grave that he goes to dig up is on a little platform that has pumpkins it's all pumpkin over patch. it, which looks so cool. And I kind of hope that it, that is what I am buried in. I, I want oh. a small raised platform with pumpkins, <laughs> and I also want I want to be buried. Uh, in fetal position, much like Pumpkinhead. <laughs> and you, you also want to be buried by Haggis. Oh, 100%. <laughs> I, listen, if if Haggis could just hang out with me constantly until the moment I'm ready to be buried, and then, you know, she can die if she needs to. Or, you know, continue. I, I assume Haggis is an immoral being. Maybe Haggis is the one that's producing your new death metal record album. Thank God. I'm glad we finally got Haggis in because <laughs> she's going to push us in directions that we weren't thinking of going. She's going to work those faders. She's going to mess with those oh, mics. Oh, man. She's going to be like, the things give Haggis me another can take. Do with a fader. Oh, my God. And so he goes out there and he finds that, that raised platform pumpkin patch thing and he digs up this weird little fetal corpse pumpkin head thing. Yeah. It kind of looks like the kid from Trick or Treat a little bit. It, it does. Huh. Didn't think about that. And uh, also, it just looks like a, like a gelat. It just, I don't know. It's kind How of like, it, it, looks, it, it, it's it looks like it's made of, of like, like roots featureless. and stuff. Kinda, what were you saying? I was saying, it kind of looks like it's like made of like roots and stuff. Like, yeah. It's really yeah, strange. It, it's sort of mummified. Yeah. Um. So yeah, he takes that back to... To our girl Haggis, my girl who, Haggis, she she gets a little bit of Ed Harley blood and a little bit of Billy Harley blood, Billy and, blood, oh Billy blood, and as soon as she starts taking blood from Ed, he starts getting woozy. Yeah, um, and she so didn't. she takes the mixture of the Ed and Billy blood and pours it uh, at the mouth area of the pumpkin head that's that's and a really interesting thing about witches steve is while they do have like you said the mastery of things like potions and, and roots and salves and things like this they have not yet figured out that whenever you draw blood orange juice is immediately needed afterwards to replenish the sugars and oh stuff. yeah 100 what is she doing just just maybe an orange slice anything and a chocolate chip cookie yeah a cookie just something poor bedside manner on her part Yelp reviews yeah. coming back bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you're right. She pours the blood into the mouth of the thing, and that's when, like, uh, Ed, like, kind of faints and passes out, and he starts kind of, like, spazzing out and stuff, and the creature is coming to life, and slowly, like, through an image of shadows and stuff like this and close-ups of various features, we see that it's, like, growing and expanding and kind of inflating and stuff, taking on life, and it's fucking it's really huge. Cool. It's big, dude. <laughs> Yeah, I I really enjoyed the the transformation and the lights there's, are flashing and stuff yeah, too. The, yeah, there's one part of the transformation where um like Pumpkinhead sort of has the mouth open and it it looks different than it ever does throughout the movie. So yeah. they made a specific model just for this mid 
transformation look. Right. And it's so it's it's such a great model and it's also so like gross looking. I yeah. really enjoyed it. I did too, man. And and again, it's like it looks so good because it's fucking real. Yes. And uh, I should mention that um I I I just read that they there is a Pumpkinhead remake in the works. No. Um the uh, person involved with it says that he he uh, wants to do everything as practically as possible. So hopefully, they'll start like try to stick to practical effects. But even then, I I don't know that you're gonna come up with something that looks as good as this does. Well, let so. me t- let me tell Homeboy what as practical as possible actually means. It means 100% all practical. Yes, because yes. clearly movies like this and Alien and all kinds of other stuff show you that 100% practical is fucking great. Yeah. Just like be creative mm-hmm. with a camera angle every now and then and you'll get something great it takes, looking. It takes more time. That's always going to be the issue. It takes more time. Um, it, ta- it takes a lot of planning, a lot of work, and yeah. you, you can get behind, and people just don't want to wait yeah. anymore, I guess. I don't want to wait. And so then we <laughs> <laughs> we go to uh, Ed driving in his truck with Billy's corpse, and we get that like random jump scare of Billy in the truck, and he comes back to life, and he's like, what did you do to me, Pa? But then it turns out that it's just him tripping out or something because he's not – He's yeah. not back. Well, it, uh, this is, I think, a good. This is like a really good point for the overall moral of the story, which is that Ed Harley is the monster. Right. Throughout this, Ed Harley is the problem. Right. He's the one who caused the issue. Um, he, he even the issue of his son being unattended. He, the, those kids aren't responsible. I mean, his son didn't get hit by someone who's maliciously driving a motorcycle at him. He got hit because he was over a blind hill where people were riding motorcycles. And really, it might even be Gypsy's fault. Who's responsible. I mean, really the dog might be fucking responsible. You know what? That Gypsy, God damn it, Gypsy. I think this movie, and even the naming of Gypsy, this movie may be made to respawn hatred towards Gypsies. Oh my God. (laughs) Is this, is this an alt right movie? <laughs> Wait, have the alt right come out against gypsies yet? I wonder. Oh, uh, that's when we know. That's when we're gonna know that like shit is getting way real. <laughs> right, shit's super real. Ugh. Suddenly they're like, no more gypsies, and you know if your legs don't work, get out of here. <laughs> and so then Ed is back at the at the grave of his wife, which is the first time that they really referenced that Ed's wife is dead. It was never really referenced before. You just yeah. saw that it was father and son, but he's like, they killed our boy, but I'm going to get back at him. And so he's he's burying Billy next to her. And uh, then this is where, like, Maggie, Maggie goes out and wanders off into the woods being fucking useless. And Steve goes out there. And he grabs her and this he like awesome. he holds the cross in front of her and he's like, just remember, you know the yeah. the, the power of Jesus gives you strength and yada yada yada. There's kind of yeah. this subtext of like really heavily mocking religion through this whole movie, by the yes. way. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. This is the thing. Here's the thing about Pumpkinhead. Yeah, and uh, we talked about this the first time we recorded, but I think we need to get more into this. Pumpkinhead is vindictive. He's hateful. He doesn't. He he wants to mock. He, it's it's not just that he wants to kill. Yeah, he wants you Fuck to be with you too. afraid. He wants you to. He wants you to like doubt your faith. He wants everything to just fall apart for you. Yeah, and then kill you. Yeah, exactly, man. And especially if you are a uh, Christian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he fucking doesn't care for Christians. He's not a fan. And He's not a fan at all. Yeah, so Steve is trying to calm Maggie down, and as he's trying to calm her down, Pumpkinhead reaches from the tree above and just fucking starts mauling him. Yep, Steve um, gets had, and, and, and then we see Ed burying his son, and he starts like having this sort of like this sort of like murder gasm, like oh, 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 he's kind of experiencing yeah. the killing. But also kind yeah, of he's kind of jizzing in his drawers at the same time. Yeah, and Maggie, of course, is freaking out, and 
she comes running back to the cabin and she's telling them you know what what happened um and joel and chris decide they're gonna go save steve and then like after that is like probably my favorite shot in the whole movie because you got the girls in the kitchen of the cabin and they're just kind of talking mm-hmm. about what they're going to do and stuff. And then one of the girls walks to the left of the camera, and the camera kind of follows her past this sort of big bay window in the kitchen. Uh huh. And you see just a full body pumpkin head creeping past the window at the same time as her. And it's so not. And good. there's no like jump scare music, like burp. Like there's nothing like that. Nothing. There's no, no weird camera tricks. It's just there if you see it. It kind of reminds me of like. Like, legit, one of the scariest parts, I think, of any movie ever fucking made, ever. Mm-hmm. And it's so lame to say this, but, dude, that that part in Signs, where it's the video of the kid's birthday party, and that alien walks by the camera. Yes. Yeah. It's... Real good. Yeah. That 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 right there startled the living fuck out of me. But this right here, what? is to me, is kind of similar to that, where you just don't expect to see it, and there it is. And it's it's especially masterful, I think, because we've already seen Pumpkinhead a number of times. Yeah. So it, it's not the shock of seeing Pumpkinhead. Uh, it's not the shock of Pumpkinhead just like jumping out of a corner. It's the the very real shock that we already know Pumpkinhead uh, is just a destroyer. Yeah. And he's just outside the window. You just so don't like, expect to see it. We're already scared enough of this monster that when you just see him pass by the window that it's like, oh, fuck. It's awesome. Which is almost like a Jaws moment. The thing is, yeah. like, with Jaws, like, you don't have to set up that a shark's scary. So, like, the moment you see the, the fin, it's like, oh, fuck. Eh, but with Pumpkinhead, there's a little setup, but it's already pretty early, and we see him, and it's just like, oh, fuck. This is not going to end up well. I love that shot. It's so cool, man. And the guys are out there, and they find Steve's bloody bandana hanging in a tree. Yeah. And so they're, like, coming back to the cabin and stuff, and they open the the door to the cabin, and uh, actually, I think it's like, I can't remember how it happens, but either way, (laughs) Steve is, like, hanging over the doorway of the porch, He's being hung over there by Pumpkinhead. Kind of like what you're saying. Him just, like, fucking with him. Like, look at your dead friend. Yeah. He's like, look, I, I have your Steve, the one you care about. Yeah, the, uh, the, the good guy. Kind of let you know yeah, off the bat, I, too, that even the good guys like Steve are going yeah, to get fucking the, murdered. Steve, yeah, Steve has proven himself thus far to be, like, the best of the of the people. He's the one who's who seemed to care the most and work the most to make this, like, work out. Um, Pumpkinhead yeah. grabs Maggie then. Yes, Pumpkinhead grabs Maggie and just, this is so brutal, grabs her and etches a cross into her face. I know. Dude, it's just so like fucking like, mocking. The first time that I saw this, I don't think I really noticed that it was a cross. I thought he was just like scratching her face, but he totally carves a cross into her forehead just to be like, fuck you. Yeah. It's brutal. Yes. Yeah, and I, I'm Metal. not positive on this, but whenever he, like, Pumpkinhead lowers Steve in front of them all, and Maggie says Steve, I, it sounded to me, if you listen closely, that you can hear Steve, like, <laughs> Pumpkinhead says the name, and later, I'm positive that when Tracy says Chris, when Pumpkinhead gets Chris, he does say Chris. Damn. Like, it's like he's like really driving it home just like yeah steve that's right i got it it's awesome and ed has the vision of pumpkin head slashing the cross onto maggie's head too yeah and which is so fucking cool and then like that's when ed goes to haggis and he's like yeah i want pumpkin head to stop i want to call this off and she's like no it's too late you've already set this in motion and yeah, uh, that's not a thing there's a there's a cool line stop. Where, there's a cool line where he's like god damn you and then she goes, he already has, which is cool. Uh-huh. And she seems, yeah, she seems really at, at peace with that, which is, um, the more I watch horror movies with witches, the more I start to admire uh, characters like Haggis, who are just like, I don't give a fuck. She's, <laughs> like, fuck, she's living fuck the life. Yeah. She's like, it's the lifestyle. Yeah, <laughs> it's that witch lifestyle, bitch. I know. And then I love this scene because it shows Pumpkinhead, and he grabs Maggie's head and kind of like, 
just sort of like smudges her face all over the kitchen glass oh, above the sink from, from the window. He just kind of like smears her face and then smashes her head through the kitchen glass. Which right. is especially I, brutal. And then, like, her blood is, like, going into the sink and shit. Yes. It's awesome. It's so cool. It, it, it is so... Like, the thing with the violence in this movie is that there is no excuse for it. Like, if you're watching a Friday the 13th movie and you buy into the the morality of a slasher, it's like, yeah, those kids, you know, they deserve to die because they had sex or whatever. Yeah, but like you're watching this, and it's just like, like it's Ma- just senseless. And it's like, like Maggie, hate Maggie wasn't violence. boning. Maggie wasn't boning nobody for sure. No, she was the one who tried. She tried to save the kid. Yeah, and she was doing nothing the but fretting about two guilt. The people and, he kills are the ones who tried the hardest to help. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which again is really cool. And the thing is too about the. Like that shot of her getting pushed through the glass and then her blood all linked into the sink and stuff. Mm-hmm. There's actually not very much gore in this movie. I actually no. I wouldn't have minded if there was a little bit more juice in the movie. Right. Um, but at the same time, because it it's not you know just a total splatter fest. Whenever there is gore, you do notice it. So there is something to say yeah, about that. Yeah, that was pretty bloody. And so um, that's when. Let's see. Who is it gets the, the machete? It's uh, Joel. Joel goes out there and he gets right. a machete. And he goes out there and his dirt Joel, bike is all fucked up. Uh, Joel has, like, there's this interesting thing. If you pay attention just uh, in between the deaths, Joel comes to terms with what he's done and decides to accept the blame. Yeah, he and, does. He has a little change of heart in there somewhere. Yeah. Again, and even he he's not decides, that bad of a guy. Yeah, he's not even that bad. Like, maybe, you know, he was just drunk. He sobered up a little bit, and he realized, like, no, this is stupid. I'm doing the wrong thing. I need to do the right thing. He decides to do the right thing, and when he does that, he gets, you know, uh, nothing good happens. Yeah. Like, his girlfriend gets killed. Exactly. And that's what we see is, like, he's a... Uh, he gets a machete and he looks outside and his bike is all fucked up. And then he realizes that Pumpkinhead is like in the house. And that shot is really oh, sick. Great shot. Because we've been seeing Pumpkinhead under the, like we said earlier, most of the exterior the light blue, is yeah. blue, but most of the interior light is like orange or red. Uh-huh. So we see Pumpkinhead inside and it's under the kind of orange red light, but there's also these like flashes of blue. And yeah. um, there's all this smoke and there's that cool like. Every time Pumpkinhead's on screen, there's this, like, cicada sound effect. Yes. That I think is really effective. I like that a lot. Very Predator-esque in a lot of ways, actually. Uh, but I, I do like it a lot. And he looks real drippy. He's he's oozy. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I'm not sure what that is. Like, is he is he drooling? Is, is it just, like, a amniotic fluid type of thing? Like... I'm gonna go with perspiration. Like maybe he smelled real cute. Oh, he's like, sweaty. Like real cumin-y. Yeah. Like he smelled like taco meat. Like he was like, it's a lot of work killing all these people. I work up. I sweat. What? What can you do? You got. You got to get that prescription string. <laughs> Just like go all out. I know it's like nine bucks, but it's worth it. Yeah. And um, he grabs Kim so, and carries her away, and yeah. takes her outside <laughs> and. Puts her up really high in a tree and throws her down from it. I like how quick he got up the tree. He scurried up that tree, like, hyper fast. I like that. Such a brutal death. She, like, breaks her back on a rock. to the top of a tall tree and drops her on a rock. Yeah. (laughs) That's, like, that's when there should have been, like, an ECW chant going on. ECW. (laughs) (laughs) He should have dropped her on the Mexican announce table and broken it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what if he had Taz plexed her through the rock? Like the rock broke like she was Bam Bam Bigelow. I'm a big fan of the fact that you brought up Taz, the master of the suplex. Yeah. That's fucking the great. The master of the suplex. Oh, Taz plex all day, man. And so <laughs> that's when Ed arrives on the scene and he sees all the bodies in the house and stuff like this. And that's when we, we cut to the rest of the teenagers. They're going through... Again, this is where, what's the locations of everything? Because they're banging on, like, Hillbilly Jim's door asking yeah, for help. They're they, asking all these other people in the town. They, they go to that one house, and they bang on the door, and you just see, like, this super callous woman. granny in a bonnet, and yeah. she just doesn't give a fuck. 
Yeah, and I want to use that okay. as like I want a gif of that that I can use whenever just, I just want to post like, like I don't give a fuck. Like not giving a fuck. Yeah, callous bonnet <laughs> granny. They uh, earlier when they were driving in, they saw a guy on the side of the road and he looked really scruffy and Steve said that he heard uh, a guy had killed his wife and he ate her just to hide the body and he talks about foot soup oh now, yeah that guy I am pretty sure is the guy that they run into oh after that who has the dog I am not positive on that huh I hadn't thought about but that it, he looks like him so they run into this guy. They're trying to, like, I guess, Jimmy open a truck to try to steal it or whatever to get away. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a guy who has a gun, and, you know, he's he says, you know, uh, drop your gun, etc. And he uses my I, favorite hillbilly line, which every hillbilly in a movie uses, which is, go on, get. Go on, get. Go on, get. Go on, get. Go on here. Get. Don't nobody need you around here. I love it, man. And so um, he's got a dog with him. He's well, like, yeah, he you guys need to get the fuck out of here and stuff. Yeah, he kind of explains a little bit. He he tells them he can't help them because if he does, then he'll be next. Right, right. Again, a little more about the, the Pumpkinhead lore. And then Pumpkinhead shows up, and old that old prospector guy runs off. And uh -huh. uh, But the dog doesn't. The dog stays around. Yeah, the dog's like, I'm interested to see what develops here. <laughs> yeah, what, what's going to happen here? And um, uh, Ed shoots Pumpkinhead with his gun. Which knocks Pumpkinhead down and gives Joel the impression that, uh, like, despite the fact that there's obviously still 20 more minutes of the movie to go. Yeah, he, he doesn't thinks know. thinks Pumpkinhead's dead. What an idiot. Yeah. Uh, but he he walks over and he shoots Pumpkinhead in the head, which is, I mean, pretty good horror movie protocol. Make sure it's dead. But yeah, that's not how Pumpkinhead works. No, nope, because he's still alive. Is a bit different. Yeah. And he grabs um, Joel by the uh, by the ankle and throws him down, and then yeah. proceeds with a, a very unorthodox death style because Pumpkinhead grabs like the <laughs> the shotgun there, grabs the rifle, he picks and at first he's kind of like. He's kind of posing in the moonlight for a second, and he looks kind of like OG for a little while. Yeah, it looks like, oh my God, is a monster in a monster movie about to use a gun. Yeah. Like, it's so crazy. And he does, but, instead, but not the way you think. He uses it so differently. He stabs Joel with the gun. Runs him through. And Yes. It's not even a gun that, with a bayonet. Like, it's a blunt object no. going through a human Just being. Shoves a blunt gun right through a person's body. Which is so brutal. And he, like, picks him up by it and stuff. And again, it's like, there's not really, like, there's not, like, sprays of gore going on. I mean, it's really just he no. gets impaled by this gun. But it's pretty, pretty cool. It's not what you expect to see. Yeah, I, it's definitely... One of my favorite horror movie deaths, for sure. And the dog... Stabbed by a gun. The dog is... Which is also the name of my next thrash metal band. <laughs> Stabbed by a gun. And that's when, like, the dog, which has been going nuts there, it attacks Ed, and it kind of, like, momentarily yeah. disrupts Pumpkinhead's concentration. It, like, yeah, makes whenever, him drop Joel. Whenever the dog bites Ed's arm, Pumpkinhead reacts as though his own arm was bitten. Right. So... There's a connection. We've already seen, you know, that there's definitely Ed is experiencing what Pumpkinhead is experiencing, but now we know that also Pumpkinhead is experiencing what Ed is experiencing. Exactly. So. And then we go to the to the Hillbilly Jim's family, and they're getting all locked inside <laughs> of their little hovel there for safety. And they send Bunt to bed, and uh, then Bunt's like, I've got to help these fucking people. And Bunt sneaks out. I think partially because, like, I think Bunt just wants to know if this Pumpkinhead business is real or if it's just bullshit his parents were telling him. Yeah, he's um, he's a precocious young man. He uh, he won't take their word for it. He wants to know for himself. And, yeah, he, he seems to not understand the gravity of the situation. Because I think maybe he thinks it's not real. Yeah, he thinks like, oh, this isn't real. There's no way that's real. Um, but yeah, he he runs into the uh, Chris and Tracy, 
who he offers to help and his help is to take them to an old like broken down church yeah because his explanation is pumpkin head is some kind of demon and so this church right. being hollowed ground should be should work and it's like an old just totally burnt out like dilapidated church and dude the set and the lighting and stuff looks so fucking good it looks like a king diamond stage set <laughs> Cause it's like you're saying this, this movie should like King Diamond should get a co-writing credit for this movie. Oh yeah, without a doubt, man. And <laughs> I mean, have you? I, I don't know. Have you ever seen uh, Winston and King Diamond in a room together? I don't know. You know what? I okay. I'm gonna go ahead and admit this. I have seen Winston in a room, and next door was King Diamond. But whenever I said to Stan Winston. You know what? I'm going to go next door, see what King Diamond's up to. He said, can you hold on just a second? Uh-huh. Then he left the room. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. so not sure. Not positive on that. Myth busted. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's kind of telling the myth of Pumpkinhead about how it's this old demon that extracts vengeance and, and yada yada. Yeah. And then it's and, like, while they're talking, he's like, yeah, he's only summoned when people do something real bad, like kill somebody. And then, like, you can see Bunt kind of realizes he's like, oh, shit. I'm a part of this. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're like, oh, you know, these, these are the people that killed Ed's boy. And I'm the one that directed Ed to Bunt and, he- yeah. or, sorry, directed Ed to, to Haggis and helped summon this thing. So that's kind of cool. He sort of realized he's like, oh, shit, I'm kind of responsible. Which, again, like you said, Mark Twain narrator, pretty, pretty damn accurate. Yeah, like he's yeah he's having he's having uh he's the one who learns something from all of this, and like, then uh and so then, yeah like he seems to be the main character to me or the 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 narrator at the very least. And then Pumpkinhead um, shows up in my notes. I like my notes here because it says Pumpkinhead arrives, stomping, smashes cross for metal. Dude, Pumpkinhead, <laughs> I the only thing that would have made this scene make more sense is if. It, Pumpkinhead had corpse makeup on. Oh, if he was corpse like, He shows up Norwegian black metal style, oh, and he's man. just like, oh, decrepit church, let me take that uh, cross and just smash the shit out of it. Decrepit church is the, my next black metal band, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually like a fucking sick black metal band decrepit name. Decrepit church. And dude, like, there's this shot of, because the, the church is, is like a long, typical kind of church building, and this is something about this movie that is so badass that we've mentioned. They go and just show us a several seconds long shot of a full body uh-huh. man in a rubber suit, pumpkin head, stomping across this churchyard, and it looks bad as fuck. Like it looks. It really does. It looks awesome, man. And that's the thing is like typically in all these, you know, rubber suit movies of the of the olden age. You know, it's like through most all of Alien, other than that very last shot when you see the alien ejected from the back of the ship, which looks really bad, Uh it's like they only show you parts of the creature because they know if they show you the whole thing, it'll look bad. Um, Right, yeah. It's just kind of like the ultimate rubber suit no-no to show the whole thing, especially in motion in a wide shot. It'll look like a guy (laughs) in a rubber suit, and this doesn't because the costume and stuff— is so good like i watch it and i'm like i'm trying to figure out how this works because it's clearly like 10 feet tall and a guy on weird stilts and Mm -hmm. the tail is articulated like the tail doesn't look like a big foam latex tail trailing after it um yeah the guy who plays pumpkin head in this tom woodruff jr first off does such a great job His articulating is amazing. and and making Pumpkinhead uh, seem vulnerable somewhat, or like giving giving Pumpkinhead some personality, right? For sure. Uh, he also played a graboid in Tremors. Oh shit! And a xenomorph in several Alien films. No so, way. Yeah, he he has experience as a uh, weird movie monster. That's cool uh, shit. But he definitely did a great job in this. I, I, the, I mean, I don't know. The, definitely, for sure, the the costume itself is 
what sells it and and what they do with the facial expressions and things with the costume make Pumpkinhead so great. Oh but yeah. I, I think also his movements and the way that he is very menacing uh without being like overly uh uh, like overly drawing attention to his movements, like he does a great job. Yeah, it's it's really really, it's amazing. And, and again, like the only thing I can think of where I've seen full body shots of a, a rubber suit monster that looked as convincing and didn't take you out of the moment is when I think about aliens, because there's a lot of yeah. full body shots in there. That's yeah. about the only thing I can think of that is on par. I mean, seriously, like. I know that this isn't like the best horror movie ever made, but the special effects and especially the suit and stuff, it's some of the best special effects ever. It really is. Yeah, for sure. And so then I, we, we run to the, the kids are running to try to find their, their vehicle and stuff. And Pumpkinhead is like flipped over the, the, the vet and the SUV and stuff. But the, uh, one of the motorbikes, uh, Chris's dirt bike seems okay. So he hops on. And uh, <laughs> and this is where this it, is awesome. It is, and also like kind of bad, but it kind of goes back to what you said, where it's like Pumpkinhead is out to kind of fuck with these people, because yeah. Chris tries to start the bike and it won't start, and then we see Pumpkinhead show up, and he's like dangling the bike chain by his finger, like mm mm yeah. mm, like it needed it's like a so, sample. It's of, like a Bugs Bunny type of moment almost. Yeah, it's like it's, looking for something. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also so menacing like it is this is a creature that also overturned two very large automobiles yeah so, i wanted like, to see the shot of like him kind of fumbling with removing that chain with his very large <laughs> slimy fingers and stuff like i wanted to see the shots of him kind of like struggling with it and be like damn it and like looking up to see if they've made it there yet or not and you know just really kind of <laughs> fucking with it um, He's got tools out. He he wants it to look like you could start the bike when you get there. So yeah. he doesn't want to just rip it out. Yeah. Oh, no. He's like, it's got to be convincing. He's also got, like, the 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 maintenance guide for removing, you know, parts and servicing the motorcycle. And he's and scratching his head. He's like, I, uh, why? I don't understand. Like, <laughs> what does this mean? Socket A? What is socket A? He's got mechanical knowledge and a killer instinct. And then off in the distance, a force ghost of Haggis shows up, and she's just like, call the maintenance line. <laughs> <laughs> and so I like this shot because Chris is on the bike, and then Pumpkinhead dangles a chain. And then Pumpkinhead picks up the whole bike and Chris, like Chris With on the Chris, bike. Yeah. He picks it up and throws it like a mile, um, which, yeah. which is cool. I've never seen anybody thrown on a motorcycle. Yeah, it's, a, it's a new experience for me too, uh, and Chris is sort of. I guess they make they make a point of showing us that he's not dead. Yeah, he's sort of like just out of it. And then uh, Tracy and Bunt start to run away, and Ed shows up, uh, and he's like, "Hop on in, I'll take you back to Harley Manor. We'll get out of here." Yeah. And whenever this happens. Pumpkinhead decides, well, I should take Chris with me. So he picks Chris up by the head and just starts dragging him along. He's like, I might need this later. Pretty cool, pretty cool moment, I think. Yeah, it is. It's awesome. And so, like, Tracy, they're, they're back out at, like, Ed's barn and stuff where Ed's working on rigging something up and Tracy's trying to explain, you know, the accident and how it's like, we didn't She's apologizing, et cetera, yeah. Exactly. And Ed's rigging up, like, kind of a turbocharged version of that flamethrower he was using for uh, for killing weeds earlier in the flick. Mm-hmm. And I, um, he, then this, is, this part right here, okay, this kills me because it shows Bunt, and he's, like, sitting on a bed in, uh, I guess it's, like, Billy's bed in the house. Right. And there's this, like, totally completely pointless jump scare where like the dog just comes onto the screen and there's huge jump scare like Burp. yeah what there the fuck are is that three for? pointless jump scares in this movie that i think were probably studio notes like where they were like this movie doesn't really scare anybody we need moments where there's just a jump scare at the beginning the when the guy's running from pumpkin head he like gets scared out of nowhere by a scarecrow oh yeah no that's sense. right yeah like what the fuck yeah. is that for 
Uh, it, it makes then, as much sense as like in another. I can't remember exactly what happened. It should have showed. Well, there's like the Billy in the vehicle. Like, Pa, what right. did you do to me? Yeah. Ugh, like that. That was totally, totally kind of unnecessary. But it did make me laugh a little bit because it's just like it's just a dog. <laughs> yeah, calm down, dude. <laughs> Worst shit is happening. And so Pumpkinhead um, shows up, and Ed starts like spazzing out and stuff, right? Yeah, he his face starts getting different. His eyes are like turning kind of red, and, bulbous. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, it starts changing a bit, and Tracy is freaking out, and then it cuts back to the cabin where Bunt is, and Pumpkinhead uh, opens the door and drops Chris at the door, which again is pretty cool yeah he's like i don't need this right now yeah uh and and bunt hides in the closet uh and this is a good like i think a good homage to halloween it's what it seemed to me like very halloween-esque like he's in the closet it's also very much like alien because he's in the closet and then it seems almost like he's gonna get out of it like Pumpkinhead's not gonna find it but then he comes back and, and puts his face like right in Bunt's face, which is very much like, you know, Alien. Which um, is cool. So, yeah, that, that's a, a cool, scary moment. And he, he takes, he grabs Bunt and drags him along. And so then, like, we we have Ed fixing to exit the, uh, the barn there with the flamethrower. And he jabs himself kind of through the arm and shoulder on a pitchfork yeah. that was leaning up against the wall. Real clumsy move by Ed. But, bad, bad move. But we do discover that if something uh, hurts Ed, I mean, we already saw this, but Ed really sees it. Uh, if something hurts Ed, it seems to hurt Pumpkinhead, because as soon as he jabs himself in the arm with the pitchfork, Pumpkinhead drops bunt. Right. And starts, like, howling in pain. Exactly. And so then Ed, like, tosses the flamethrower off of himself. He tosses it out on the ground towards uh, Tracy is still alive, right? Yeah, Tracy is, is still there. And at this point is where I became kind of aware that, like, the vocal noises that Pumpkinhead makes sound pretty silly. Like, he's just kind of like, uh Like, he almost, sounds like e- <laughs> he almost sounds like E.T. or something. Like, as ferocious as he looks, the sound of his voice isn't... It's just not really quite right. Or, or he sounds like maybe he sings background vocals on a near-death metal band. <laughs> uh, 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 and so then, like, Tracy grabs the flamethrower, and she starts trying to torch Pumpkinhead, which is kind of ineffective. Ed is rushing towards his truck to get a pistol out from the dashboard, and uh, he shoots himself in the noggin, which makes yeah, which, him and Pumpkinhead yeah, both fall. Yeah, uh, it takes out Pumpkinhead, sort of. And Ed, he kind of, like, stumbles around, even though he's got this huge head wound. Yeah, and uh, which um, is... Like a brutal fact, I guess, of uh, anybody out there uh, thinking of committing suicide by gun. Uh, real truth, lots of people uh, shoot themselves in the head but don't die. So, uh, <laughs> pro tip. what do you think it? Yeah, pro tip. Pro tip, not the best move. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, Ed is stumbling and, and um, Pumpkinhead grabs Bunt by the leg and and gets up and starts heading towards Tracy which um, Tracy sort of has put this together now that she needs to shoot Ed but she also doesn't want to shoot a person so there's a little bit of a struggle there kill me yeah Um, very predator moment and so she finally does she shoots him uh, a few times Uh, don't know why she didn't just walk over and stick it you know, somewhere where she knows it would kill him yeah. instead of just randomly blindly shooting at him. But That's anyway, true. she shoots him and it does kill him, uh, also killing Pumpkinhead. And then Pumpkinhead then catches on catches fire. Catches on fire? Yeah. He's a flammable <laughs> sort of guy. Yeah, you got to be careful when hanging out with Pumpkinhead because that dude... <laughs> might catch on fire he's combustible and so then the the, <laughs> the last shot in the movie is we see uh haggis back out at razorback holler there uh 
out at the pumpkin patch, reburying the little pumpkin head corpse. And as she's shoveling dirt onto it, you see that the little corpse that she's burying has that the Burning Man necklace that Ed received from Billy yeah. earlier in the movie. And also, when she was putting the corpse in, you could see it had hair on top of its head. Oh. Which, yeah. I didn't notice so that. So th- this, is, this is Ed, right? Like, yeah. That's the yeah. impression that, also, I, that also, I got. Yeah. Also, the, at the end with Pumpkinhead, if you pay attention, suddenly the face on Pumpkinhead becomes more defined. And it looks... Either like Ed, which is what I, I think they're going for, is that the the creature and Ed are becoming one. Mm-hmm. They're becoming, you know, the oh, same. Oh, yeah, you're talking about like while they're both they're like both Ed still alive. Or it looks like Haggis. I mean, I, yeah. I think they're going for Ed, but also the face could be Haggis. That's true. I kind of I kind of assumed it looked more like Ed. Yeah, that's a cool detail I forgot to mention. Is there towards the end of the showdown there? Yeah, the the pumpkin head started to look more like ed which which is cool i like that i kind of yeah. like that like his you know his rage was becoming him basically yeah and 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 now he will be the next pumpkin head well so here's a question which, here's a question that i have so okay so if you summon the pumpkin head then you become the next pumpkin head right seems that way so yeah. who was the pumpkin head in this one that's a good question. Was it whoever summoned the pumpkin head on the guy we saw at the beginning? Uh-huh. Or, exactly. Or is it a is it a more frequent occurrence than every thirty years? Like, Wouldn't it be badass if like if that was actually Ed's dad that summoned the pumpkin head? <laughs> Because it's like yeah. all, all that stuff in the flashback at the first is never really clarified. He's just like, I didn't kill that girl. What if like that girl was actually like, you know, Ed's sister and like, it, oh, shit, you know, it's like, I'm just totally, this is totally not based on anything. Yeah, what I'm talking but no, about. That's but a it, cool idea. But it would be cool because then basically that would mean that this whole time, you know, Ed, Ed's fighting his father. Yeah. And basically Ed was also becoming his father. Right. Like, that would have been yeah. a really cool kind of subtext to add to the movie, I think, anyway. Especially if Pumpkinhead had cut off his hand. Yeah. And then said, Ed, I'm your pappy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's how that's how the, the flick ends. And it, it spawned a couple of sequels. I think it had a... It did. Part two, and then I think three and four were just like sci-fi channel movies. Have you ever seen any of them? Yeah. I haven't, I haven't seen any of the sequels. Um, I I am interested in the remake idea only to see where they go with it, but I almost I'm I'm almost positive it, it can't end well. But I, I thought that did. about the Evil Dead remake and I found myself, you know, eaten eating crow there it's but so but then you also thought that about the nightmare on elm street remake and then found yourself uh, to be very correct right <laughs> yeah yeah or the texas chainsaw massacre remake i heard or, the friday you know 13th remake was every bad. remake yeah basically all of them other than evil dead basically <laughs> yes um i'd like to watch i like to at least watch the second one i think the second one is called like Pumpkinhead blood wings which seems yes. metal enough for me to check out. Um, yeah, Blood Wings. I, so does Pumpkinhead fly now? Because that, I mean, I don't know that he needs to fly, but if he can, that's pretty cool. I don't hate it if he does. Right. Um, so I'd well, like to, it, I'd like to like at least find that one. Snape flies. Oh. In, like, remember that? Like, I, I remember that being so cool and then thinking, like, isn't apparating, like, cooler than flying it seems like less work and faster <laughs> it does it seems like a whole lot less work um three and four i can't I, I literally don't know anybody who has ever seen them i don't even know if i've seen, known anybody that has seen the second one but i'd still uh yeah. i'd still like to check it out what's your what's your overall kind of thoughts on this flick there steve um okay so this came at a time in horror movies where sequels were the thing 
and and nothing really new or original was coming out mm. and this is new and original and i really like it yeah i mean this this um and hellraiser came out about the same time right and the th- the two of those movies they like, they really they showed a way forward for monster movies and and slasher movies that like never panned out I think this movie's great. I think it it had a lot of potential, and Stan Winston did a really good job of not relying too much on character development for all of the the different characters. Really, just focusing on a couple of characters, not having too many, I guess, um, important conversations. Like he he played up to his strengths which were visual effects and, and and shooting good deaths and it, he he did a great job in that this is a good movie it's well worth watching uh it's not one of the best movies ever made uh i'd give it about a seven out of ten maybe about a seven six point five to seven um i'm with you like i i totally back the fact that this was an original idea um that wasn't based on any pre-existing franchise or anything like that, which, like you said at the time, was a very, very rare thing. Um, I like it. And like I said, to me, it's totally worth watching because the visuals are literally some of the best practical uh, costume makeup effects in, in history. Like, they're really... Yes. Really fucking awesome, man. Like, the suit is incredible, and then the suit is, de- you know, topped off with this animatronic head that had i wonder how many like little servo motors are in that head because it is fully articulated at all times um which is really rad and lance hendrickson does a really cool job and um the kid that plays bunt actually does a good job and i like the character of haggis and stuff too It's, it's worth watching totally for the visuals you won't get a whole lot out of the characters um the the plot is extremely extremely simple but but as we said, with some interesting twists, in that there's a lot of innocent deaths in there, and and basically the the adult, the one with the loss, is actually kind of the bad guy for summoning this thing. That's an interesting twist that you don't see in any any movies of the same era. Yeah. So I do like that about it. Um, it doesn't make me as it doesn't make me as happy as like watching an old Elm street or Halloween or, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of the, some of the earlier Friday the 13th flicks where Mm -hmm. like those movies legitimately like make me happy to watch. It just puts me in a good mood because they're, they're fun. Um, this isn't one of those ones that, that I see myself like watching repeatedly because I'm like, I want to watch a movie that'll put me in a good mood. Let's put in pumpkin head. Um, whereas I'll do that with, you know, (laughs) let's watch Elm street or something like that. Right. Um, but it is one of those ones that, I think is great to have on on your TV during a Halloween party. Oh, sure, yeah. Because it's filled with so many nice cool visuals, visuals and yeah. the story is so, so simple that, like, you can be, you know, chatting and bullshit and drinking with your friends and stuff like this, zone out for 15 minutes, and not really miss much. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good party movie, you know? Yeah, you look back and suddenly someone's being stabbed with a gun, and you're like, you know what? This was a good call. Sounds about right. Kind of like, kind of like zombie or something like that, where it's like really uh-huh. simple story, so you can just kind of zone in and out of it and still have a good time with it. So, it's one of those for me. I would, I would say like, I'd probably rate it about a six out of ten. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's a that's a fair rating for sure. Yeah, but definitely worth checking out, especially if you like. If you like strong visual effects, if you know what Fangoria magazine is, uh, you should watch this movie. <laughs> Fangoria, never heard of it. No, is that like Time? It's more like Tiger Beat. Oh, okay. <laughs> that Tiger Woods <laughs> fan magazine. Exactly. I love that one. Yeah. <laughs> well, on the uh, on the next episode, which will actually take place in the past, I think even. Whoa pre uh pre trump's america if i'm not mistaken oh god yeah it'll be a glimpse back so. to a better time back to our salad days steve <laughs> yeah when we were just talking about clive barker's hellraiser oh which is is one of my one of my favorites love 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 yeah. love love hellraiser so that will be so good the next episode of the show um which strangely for us won't be the next episode, but 
Whoa. No. Continuums. No. Time continuums. But we're going to keep that next episode secret. Super secret. So uh, where can they find us in the meantime, Steve? Well, you can always uh, email us at deadandlovelypod at gmail.com. Or you could find us on Twitter or Instagram at deadlovelypod. Dead lovely pod. We also have a, a Facebook uh, page, I believe. I think that we do. Uh, I say that I believe that when I know that I set it up. So, <laughs> yes, it did happen. <laughs> you can also find me on uh, Twitter, at Steven Spratling, or Instagram, at Steven Spratling. And you can find me on my, my YouTube channel, youtube.com backslash Ben Eller Guitars, where you can find all my, my fun and informative guitar lesson videos. You can also find me on Twitter and Instagram, at Ben Eller Guitars. Thank you guys so much for uh, for listening. Yeah, and uh, come back next week. Come back next week. We're going to talk about a little, little Clyde Barker Hellraiser. Hellraiser, y'all. We're going to be raising some hail. Thank you guys so much for <laughs> listening. Uh, we've been dead and lovely, and you guys have been great. Bye.